All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 10th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. <clears throat> Please excuse me, I have a persistent cough, just a cold, I think. <laughs> doesn't matter, it uh, doesn't matter. I belong to the great physician, he can take care of things. Uh, it just sometimes reminds me of like, yes, I need to depend on him. Um, <clears throat> and I tend to not indulge in medications more than necessary because I find that they often come back and bite you later. Uh, plus, like coughing and runny nose is all part of our body's immune system, its response to a uh, like a viral infection. So suppressing that stuff might be, for our convenience might not be a good idea. Uh, so I tend to yeah, you know, not overindulge in that. It's like aspirin, you know, you got little wakes and pains, and next thing you know, you got an ulcer because you've been taking aspirin all the time. So, uh, and oh, by the way, Tylenol will kill your kidneys. So, it's like, what? Which would you rather have, an ulcer or lose your kidneys? Uh, supposedly, unless you overdose on it, but. There's like medications, like cold meds, uh, cough syrup. They all have put Tylenol on them. So if you're taking several different remedies to make you more comfortable, be aware that you might overdose on Tylenol and cause kidney damage. Uh, you're, we need to stay away from man-made remedies as much as possible, I think. Or, or use them in definite moderation. Uh, like people that take up uh, uh, prescribed pain medication, the next thing you know, they're addicts and out and laying out in the street. But the doctors are never responsible for that. No, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry is not responsible for that. Oh, well. Anyway, today is sort of an odd subject because uh, you know how YouTube tends to vomit stuff all over your homepage? So I saw a video from James White, and I knew he was having trouble uh, in the Reformed Baptist thing. Well, as many Christian sects, and Reformed Baptists are a sect, um... They have a standard other than the Bible. I was, years ago, when I started hearing about this, I mean, Reformed Baptist is, is a recent thing, pretty much. I mean, it's a, uh, they're not really the 1689 London Baptists, and, and who cares about what a group of London Baptists did in 1689? Uh, Christianity is about Christ, not about uh, following a particular confession and that, that's one of the problems when the confession becomes the standard rather than God's Word. And uh, I'm going to title this video, Lost in Theology. Yeah. Well, anyway, the, the video, if you want to look at it, uh, you might want a bottle of aspirin. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll warn you that just look at it for the purpose of, uh, what shall we say, uh, seeing the... the uh, the, the theological hair splitting. But the, well, apparently what happened is, oh, I don't know, maybe about a year or so ago, all of a sudden there was a, uh, a, a man named James Dozal, who I have is one of his books here. I think I've talked about him a few times. Uh, a Reformed Baptist that made it his life work to, to uh, 
convinced all other Reformed Baptists that they have to follow Thomas Aquinas, apparently. Uh, the the uh, the theology, this this really abstract theology that has to do with metaphysics. The metaphysics really of Aristotle that Augustine and others brought into Christianity. And the, what people don't understand, what happened is the Christians didn't so much completely buy into Aristotle, although a lot of them brought that in because they were previously pagans and into that philosophy and others. Uh, but they brought the language of Aristotle, his metaphysical language, to use to describe God because he has this abstract, uh, theoretical, Aristotle's theoretical idea of what a God would have to be like if he existed. Now, Aristotle was a pagan. He didn't, ha he didn't have any revelation from God other than the nature, and he didn't go there. Uh, just out of his own mind is what he, he he developed this stuff. Now, so but what people don't understand, when you adopt, now this is a lesson for today too. This is very important for us to understand today because it has to do with what's going on in our society too. When you adopt the language of some movement or some individual, you also adopt their ideas. You can't divorce their language their, uh, from their ideas. Uh, for example, you cannot use the language of Marx and class struggle and the, 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 uh, you know, the, the conflict between the, uh, the landowners and the proletariat and uh, with uh, uh, use that for something other than what Marx meant by it. Because to adopt the language is to adopt the philosophy. You can't separate the two. So if you use some, some, uh, some philosopher's language, you are also adopting their ideas because the words come from that. The class struggle, for example, uh, the, using that term has a meaning that was given to it by Marx. So if you adopt the language of Marx, you're adopting the ideology and philosophy of Marx too. So the same way is if, if Christians adopt the language of a pagan philosopher, they have also, perhaps unconsciously, adopted the ideas and thinking and philosophy of that philosopher. You cannot use Aristotle's language that, that, that is defined, that has meaning that's given to it by him without buying into his philosophy. I don't think people understand that. Words have meaning. You can't just Oh, unless you're John Piper, and then you just give your own meaning to words, and everybody else is out there confused. What is Piper saying, and what does he mean? Well, Piper is screwball. You're not allowed. Today we have people that think they can, they can just make up new meanings for words, and everybody has to buy into their meaning. No. Language is a common communication system. You have to have common meanings. You know, like words like gender, male and female. You can't just arbitrarily, they have established meanings. You can't give them a new meaning. People will not understand what you're saying. Uh, but here, what happened with the, apparently what's happened, I was wondering what, I heard the, the, the fun Reformed Baptist blew up, and I haven't been following James White because he became irrelevant. He just went off into the nether worlds when he went to, uh, especially when he went to Apology at Church with, with uh, Jeff, what's his name over there, um, got seduced. But uh, so he really, Jeff Durbin, uh, that is not a, that, that is not, Baptist is not Reformed. It's Jeff Durbin's, Jeff Durbin's church. It's a cult in many ways. Uh <clears throat> It's like a lot of these uh, 
uh, well, they don't actually own their church building anyway. They just use somebody else's, I think. But there's uh, uh, a lot of these big box celebrity churches, you know, like Joel Osteen's church or or uh, Andy Stanley's church, or you know, you could you could name. There's thousands of them. It's the pastor. He's the center, and that's it. That's that is that is that is such a corruption in Christianity. Uh, where the, the pastor has become the central and unifying factor in the church. Submission to the pastor, loving the pastor. It's about Christ. If Christ is not the center, it's not a Christian church. But this is sort of a warning that how we can get off and into theological hair-splitting and forget. But let, let's go to the Scripture first. Uh, let's see, I better not push that button. Second <laughs> uh, Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And this is about sim the whole issue is simplicity. That's the whole argument too. It's uh, that's I guess that's really an appropriate scripture for that. <laughs> but uh, they're arguing about divine simplicity. That 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 that's the whole basis for the the explosion and the casting out of of James White from the Reformed Baptists by some of the Reformed Baptists, uh, based on some obscure theoretical interpretation of their confession, a clause in the uh, uh, nature of God. It's, it's about, and why I, if you go to James Dozal's book, it's going to take you hours and hours and hours unless you've had a class in metaphysics, which I didn't. It took me, I had to listen to him for, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe 20 hours uh, listening to this, these metaphysical arguments, uh, not just James Dozal's, but others, uh, the Presbyterians and stuff, uh, in order to understand the language <laughs> that they were using and what they were trying to say. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's like, oh, you know, you, you need aspirin to do that too because of the pain it causes your brain. <laughs> it's like, oh. Your brain is like, you know how your computer, if, if, if you're doing like video editing or something like that, and, it, it, or, or I suppose playing a video game, that, that's what really loads computers down. All of a sudden, you hear the computer fan go, you know it's working. Yeah, that's like, oh, my, my, my head is hurting trying to understand this. And, yeah, I finally figured it out. Yeah, you know, yo, Okay, I understand what they're saying. They're wrong, but I understand what they're saying. Uh, and they're not always wrong. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, the, the basic See, when you get out of Scripture and you don't use Scripture as your basis anymore, but you just you go to other sources like Thomas Aquinas, really? Yeah. Now this is this is his small summa. Thomas Aquinas is not Scripture. He's not a prophet of God. He's not an apostle of God. He's certainly not Jesus Christ. This is nothing but Aquinas' opinions. That's the problem with theology. It's nothing but man's opinions. God gave us a book that in itself is sufficiently large. We've got 66 books in the Bible. And the Bible... Show me the man that's mastered the Bible entirely. No, they're not satisfied with that. They got to go off and you know, men would rather have you listen to them than listen to God. But this whole thing is this whole um, problem. And apparently, at one point, James White says they actually messed with his Wikipedia page, which is here. Uh, no, that's not it. Um, here and. They said, uh, changed it to former Reformed Baptist. <laughs> uh, 
And he, now it says evangelical reform Baptist. So it, it sounds, seems to me like James White or his people have come back and say, well, if they're going to do that, we'll just differentiate. We're the evangelical reform Baptists as opposed to the, 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 the Aquinas reform Baptists. You know, see, this is how another, another split. <laughs> okay, what are they going to call the new denomination? So the front, Reformed Baptists have, have not been doing well anyway. Um, they've had uh, uh, sexual abuse scandals and everything else, and they've just been, well, why? Well, what did we just read in the, the scriptures there? Uh, but I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, craftiness, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Simplicity. Now, I should probably... That word be singleness, simplicity, sincerity, met, mental honesty the virtue of one who is free from pretense and hypocrisy, not self-seeking, openness of heart manifesting itself in generosity. That would be, uh, what, probably Strong's. Uh, but that those, as far as the meaning of that word, mm, let's see, maybe not. What is that in the Greek? Uh, Haplotis. <laughs> no, that that's um, sincerity, sin uh, simplicity, frankness, sincere devotion to Christ. Uh, make sure we all have the correct idea here. Simplicity doesn't mean simple-mindedness. But the uh, the the debate that is has uh, imploded or exploded the Reformed Baptists is over the simplicity of God. Uh, James Dozal created a fad, and everybody now is apparently they all had to get into this uh, metaphysics, which is far removed from Scripture. Now, the Scripture, if you want to know about the simplicity of God, what does God say when when uh, Moses asks? him, uh, what is your name? He says, I am that I am. And that gets into the aseity. See, they have their own language. The ossei, uh, God is aseity. In other words, he is self-existent. He exists of himself. But but they get into their logic and all these other ideas that, that basically are highly influenced by. They're highly influenced by Aristotle necessarily because they use his language. And Augustine brought that in, and so did others. Uh, because God didn't choose to, to dissect himself and spread him out on the table for us in the Scripture. He said, salvation is by faith, not by theology, apparently, right? Uh, so we have to accept what God has revealed and as I continue to insist, and I get myself in trouble all kind, you know, it's like, how many churches can't I join simply because I will not accept a source of authority or a standard beyond the Scripture? We've got these creeds. We've got the, the Augsburg Confession and the Lutheran Book of Concord or, or the... Uh, the Nazarene uh, Handbook or the Methodist Book of Discipline or, or we got our Statement of Faith or whatever. And I said, if it's not Scripture, either it says too little or it says too much. I mean, a, 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 uh, a confession that is a description of what we believe generally you have a descriptive, you know, so, so well, how is, what do you believe at your church? Oh, this is a summary of what we believe. But we believe what the Bible teaches. It's just sort of a human, very simple summary of some of the things, you know. It's like the, uh, 
the Apostles' Creed, which is not really, I guess the Nicene would be a more universal one. But the, the, those are very specific. The Apostles' Creed was, it started apparently from a baptismal confession. Hardly adequate for a description of what Christianity is. And uh, the Nicene Confession was a specific confession listened to, uh, created to deal with a, a specific disagreement between the Arians, uh, the, the ones that held to the deity of Christ and the ones that held to the Christ as a creature. Today, it, it still persists between Christianity and Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. They, they are Arians. They don't believe that Christ is God. They don't. In case you didn't know that. They don't come to your door, knock, knock, knock. We're Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't believe that Jesus Christ is divine. They have no atonement. They have no Savior. Those are necessary implications of that. You know, if, if, if how, how can... What, what was it? Uh, uh, Jesus was the incarnation of Michael the archangel, unless they change their doctrine again. How can Michael the archangel change you, save you? Well, salvation is not based in the Jehovah's Witnesses on Christ on the cross and salvation through faith in him that we're forgiven because our sins were imputed to Christ. And he died for us. Apparently the Na many Nazarenes don't believe that either. Well, they got to be lumped with Jehovah's Witnesses then. Dead in sin and trespasses. Seeking to establish your own righteousness, which is exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses do. And the churches of Christ. I shouldn't say all them because they're not. Uh, but like traditional churches of Christ, yeah, you, you stand in your own righteousness. Yeah, Christ forgives us, but uh, we sin, and when we sin, we're lost again. It's a lot like uh, Roman Catholicism, except in the Bible, every sin is a mortal sin. You need a perfect Savior. See, if 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 your obedience to the law is the basis of your relationship with God, you're going to hell. And I don't know how many Christians think that because they try to keep, keep the Ten Commandments or they do something or other, that, 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 that's good enough. They have no idea how holy God is and how sinful they are. And I'm afraid that's true of the holiness movement. But that's not what I'm talking about this morning. But uh, the, this whole argument, let me try to break it down a little bit, uh, uh, is about the theological statement that God is simple. In other words, he's not made out of parts and pieces. Well, just a, a couple seconds of thinking, oh, yeah, of course, of course, God, God, I am that I am. He, he's not made out of pre-existent parts and assembled. Well, sure, if you state that, then we can all agree. You know, it's like, of course, God is, I am that I am. There, there's nothing that preceded him, and he's not made out of anything, and he's not assembled by anyone. He's not composed of, of component parts. Otherwise, you have to have an assembler. He's not self-assembled either. We confess there's one God. The scripture is very clear. There's only one God. And it's also very clear. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. In fact, in Jesus, Jesus himself, when he sends his apostles out to, to proclaim the gospel in the world, he says, and, and uh baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. One name. The name is the authority and identity. There's one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. But they're distinguishable. Right? We can distinguish between them, but they're not separate. 
you can't separate them. This is, you know, we think of persons as separate. Well, even we are not truly separate because we're all of Adam. We're not self-existent. Anyway, uh, so as, as long as you say that, is God is simple. In other words, that, that, even that language throws people. Because you can't understand God, really. I mean, in total. He's not simple the way we use the word. But the mean, what they're saying is he's just not made out of parts and pieces. There's one God. He's not an assembly. Like your car is an assembly of parts. That's not how God is. It's just social Trinitarianism is sort of God as an assembly. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a social relationship. Well, you, you mean there was a time when they were separate? They decided to get together and have a and and and, and be God as a as a one God rather than three. See that that's where that re leads to. I think was well, William Lane Craig. I think has had sort of a I don't know where he is now, a social Trinitarian view uh, now. That's not entirely illegitimate because the Bible talks about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in relation to one another. They're not uh, identical in, in function. They relate to one another, but that has to be carefully subordinated to, the, to, the, to one God. Otherwise, you end up with you know, it's so easy to give people wrong ideas. And that's why we have to be careful to stay in the Scripture. So this whole thing was uh, James Dazal wrote a book. Apparently it was his doctoral uh, dissertation on uh, the simplicity of God. And a lot of theology of, of God comes out of that, um, sort, of, sort of like the the idea that, that God is absolutely changeless and it all derives from that. So if you take things too far and you make you make your idea of God the foundation and you build on that rather than what the scripture says and and remember that you can't uh, that you're not God. So carefully to abide in the scriptures and that and confess our ignorance. That's God if God hasn't revealed it, we don't really know it, nor can we truly know it. So it's just like people that say you can't know God. Well, God says you can, so we can't say that. We have to abide in the scriptures. Uh, the the idea of the simplicity of God uh, as a uh, is correct. Obviously, he's not pieced together. But if you go beyond that and start building everything on that one idea that you have, you'll end up with with foolishness, and that's what. If you just listen to, a, <laughs> I, I, I went fifty-two minutes into uh, this video, and you don't have to go that far to see what I'm talking about. Uh, <clears throat> that the arcane nature that they're arguing about, what apparently the whole thing is about. If you happen to stumble across some of this. And it was sort of like why I was watching. It's like, okay, what is this issue that's, that's exploded the, the uh, uh, Reformed Baptists and made James uh, White a heretic? Uh, and it is Thomas Aquinas's interpretation of divine simplicity. Apparently, Thomas Aquinas says that the attributes of God in God are not separate. Love and justice and omniscience and omni uh, omnipotence and, uh, you know, all of them <laughs> uh, are all are not separate. Well, that's true, but the way it's explained is bad. Okay, so it's very simple to explain this. See, this is what happens when you get lost in your theology. 
and forget what it's about. <laughs> All right, so when we speak of the attributes of God, we're speaking with human words that we use to describe something. Words are, are not things that exist on their own. They are, they, they are symbols that represent something. Like we use the word love to represent, well, depends on how you use the word, uh, a particular thing or concept or action. You know, like nouns and verbs and things like that. They have a meaning. Uh, and for us, we think in terms like that. We, we don't simply you know, know without thinking at all. And... And God is communicated in words. But when we think of the attributes of God, these are words that we use to describe what God is. So we say God is just. Well, some people say God's just. That's one of the problems I got with Grider and the Nazarenes now. He denies that justice, righteousness, is an attribute of God. In other words, something that God is in his nature. So when we have the, talk about the attributes of God, all we're doing is simply saying this is God. That God is justice, God is righteousness, God is holiness, God is omnipotence. These are all descriptions of different aspects as far as our thinking of God. But God just simply is the, those things. Those are descriptors of God. You can't divide God up into love and mercy other than in human categories. He is all his attributes. Those are just words that describe his being. And I think that's what Thomas was trying to say but he's not inspired by God, so he screws up, just like we all do. But all the attributes of God are, you know, to say that it's just all one, because God's essence, God's nature, is, he is, in his nature, the things those words mean. It's not a bundle of attributes. That, that's when you're, you're losing sight of what you're doing. They are trying to describe God in human language. But he is all those things. It's not complicated. He is love. He is truth. He is grace. He is mercy. He is holy. He is just. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He is self-existent. He is simple. He's not a bundle of different qualities. Those are words to describe what God is. And that's all. But they get off into the weeds and they forget God himself in their theology. They get lost in their theology, perhaps truly lost in their theology. So it's not about Christ. They're removed from the simplicity God has revealed enough about himself in the Scripture, all we need to know. <clears throat> and we'll know him much better when we see him. When Christ returns, we will see him as he truly is, for we will be like him. But right now, we're not like him. We're not capable, but we can know him. We just can't know him comprehensively. Just like you can know a person, but you don't know them comprehensively. They don't know themselves comprehensively. Human beings, I don't know myself comprehensively. It's like, why did I do that? You know. Anyway, it, it's just uh, foolishness, and it, it shows how the devil, as that scripture says there, how the devil can can corrupt us, uh, and by his craftiness, by his uh, um, Subtility, you know, he's subtle. By his subtleness, his his sneakiness, his 
serpentine nature. He's a liar by nature. It's what he is, a liar. He's not a thing that lies. He is a lie. He is a lie. Just like God is, is, is unlike God. So you don't be led astray from the simplicity and pu purity that's in Christ. Just like Greider in his description of God. You know, see, he is corrupted by his theology. I think the reason he denies that God is by nature just is because he denies that Christ took our sins upon himself. He denies penal substitutionary atonement because he does not believe that that would be good. He believes that God has to exercise arbitrary, autonomous, I don't have the word for it, forgiveness. In other words, if you don't just forgive somebody uh, arbitrarily, in spite of your law, it's not really forgiveness. Well, God didn't do that. He atoned for our sins. He paid the penalty for us. He hates that idea. Grider hates the cross. And so does everyone who, who has, knows the truth, because it's manifestly plain in the Scripture, and chooses to believe a, a corrupt thing instead, like the, uh, uh, what is it, the governmental theory of the atonement. Now, God did uphold his public justice in a way on the cross, but not in an obvious way. That is is surely very uh, secondary. It's not, in fact, I don't think it's as, about as public, well, it is. There's, there's an element uh, you know, of that. He, he had to justify his overlooking of sin. And Grider utterly misses that. Grider is biblically ignorant. He does not understand the Scriptures. And yet he is... The, the, the theologian of the Nazarenes. He's dead now, thank God. But his ideas live on. Not that he originated these ideas, but it's so clear and, and that uh, as, as I've been thinking about this, the holiness movement, it's sort of like, why? There's something not right where I've been going because I'm not hearing Christ and him crucified. Now, now there's probably... I hate to say this, but probably 95% of the churches you go to, you won't hear Christ and him crucified on a regular or meaningful basis. They won't be talking about the atonement. Most fundamentalist Baptist churches, if it's mentioned at all, it's mentioned just as a tag on the end of the sermon. It's a rare thing, and it should not be. It's absurd. And I'm mentioning them because I know them quite well. In fact, I know of only one church in this area that I can depend that if I go there, I'll hear about Christ and him crucified. It happens to be a Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate. <laughs> but I'm probably not good enough to be accepted by them. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of unusual, too, because it's very very Roman Catholic in appearance. I mean, you go in there, it's like, what? They got a crucifix. Like, what's that? Not the kind of Lutheranism I grew up in. But but uh, at least with that particular preacher. And, and they also are, um, well, Lutherans in general. <clears throat> I shouldn't say that because I, I was looking, you know, the, <laughs> Facebook, you know, everybody doing their live streaming their services now. And I was looking at a, a Lutheran church that was a free Lutheran church, uh, which you know would probably they seem to be more like a community church because it's a country, a small country town, and you almost have to be, which is a good thing. I don't like denominations, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't don't think they were very liturgical. And I'm thinking that 
neither am I really, but every church has liturgy. But a liturgy at least restrains and makes sure that you know you, you, there's a pa pattern of reading through the scriptures. Uh, there's the the Old Testament reading, and then there's the a reading from the Gospels, and then there's a reading from a, uh, the epistles. Uh, like this Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. I was li now this happens in Catholic churches too. Uh, so the people do hear the scripture read, probably more scripture than they'll ever hear read in a Baptist church or a Methodist church or a Presbyterian <laughs> church maybe. I don't know. They're semi-liturgical. Well, some of them. <laughs> in all these cases, too, I have to say that, that among Lutherans, the largest group of Lutherans is totally apostate. Among Presbyterians, the largest group of Presbyterians is totally apostate, probably able to reform the same way. Uh, Mennonites, Mennonites the same way. I mean, you look at the largest denominations in these different families, and they're all apostate. <laughs> and then, of course, there's Rome and Francis, the barbarian. Francis the pagan. How do you, I don't know what you do with him. He's the most pagan of all popes. Trying to destroy everything. But when you get so caught up in the minutia of man-made theology, and that's what we're talking about here, and human opinion, uh, there, because we're not going to agree with each other entirely. And that's that's a problem with sectarianism, the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate, uh, that I, I think you have to receive to say that you believe everything that's in the Book of Concord. Where is that great big thing? Oh, I still got it in the house. It's like, really? I mean, it's bigger than the Bible. <laughs> no, I, it, it's not heretical, but it's just like creeds. They're human. They have error in them. Some error. They're not God. They're not God inspired. If you think they are, you've deceived yourself. the The faith was delivered once for all. That means finished. The revelation of the faith was finished when God gave it through the apostles in the first century, and so everything that came along after that is not inspired by God, nor part of the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. So when they say, well, you have to agree with the Book of Concord, I said, well, in general substance, I don't call Lutherans heretics, usually, except the biggest group of them. Uh, and globally, the same thing. Most Lutherans are absolute heretics. But that's true of, of most Presbyterians and most Roman Catholics and everything else. I mean, that's just the way it is because they're not, you have to be born again. You have to be a follower of Christ. Uh, you have to believe in what he did on the cross. You have to believe who he is. And, I mean, well, that's, Theology can deceive you, and your own heart will deceive you. It's just like uh, Greider here, where he denies that righteousness or justice and love are part of. Well, we use I'll use the word part, but you know I just mean uh, attributes, things we attribute to the nature of God. He doesn't believe that. He isn't doesn't believe that that God is by nature love in spite of the fact that John said God is love. He doesn't, he, now he believes that God is by nature holy, but he doesn't know what holiness is. The holiness movement doesn't know what holiness is. The holiness movement thinks holiness is not drinking alcohol, not smoking cigarettes, not going to movies, not playing cards, uh, not dancing, you know, things like that. that that's what holiness is. It's not holiness. Holiness is belonging to God. God is holy. Everything that belongs to God is holy, too, because it belongs to him. It's like the Old Testament, the temple. What made the temple holy? 
and belong to God. Otherwise, we're just stone. The, the vessels, all the, they were made out of gold or silver or whatever, right? What made them holy? They belonged to God. The Ark of the Covenant, what made it holy? It belonged to God. It was for his purposes. That's what makes it holy. That's what makes a person holy. You belong to God. It's not you're sinless. It's that you belong to God. So when you're trying to pursue your own sinless perfection, you're not trusting in God's salvation. You know, you're, 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 the, the whole mentality, I think, and I think my experience, I, now I have never have been a member of a Nazarene church, but I visited a number of them, and I've known, had friends that were a Naz, a retired Nazarene pastor and his wife. So I have a pretty good feel, and other friends, and I, I know their fears, and what they complain about. <laughs> and it's like and you think, oh yeah. See if if you're if you're if Christ is your salvation, if he paid for all your sins on the cross, you don't have to be obsessed with that. It's been taken care of. You don't have to make yourself perfect. God promises he will do it. Especially, eventually, it'll be culminated when Christ returns. That's when total sanctification or entire sanctification happens. When we see Christ, when he comes, the resurrection rapture, and we will be conformed to his image. And not until, not until then. The verses they use for entire sanctification say, at the coming of Christ. They don't bother to read the whole verse. They listen to their pastors who are trained by people like Greider, who's a heretic, was a heretic. Now he's a dead heretic. Where does that leave you? But Greider's denial of the inherent justice of God, that God is by nature just, uh, is a result of the holiness mindset uh, and the idea that uh, the denial of imputed righteousness and, and uh, imputed sin. It just denies what Christ did. Well, if you deny the cross, if you deny that Christ paid for our sins on the cross, he took the punishment on himself and it's paid in full, then of course you have to pursue your own holiness because you've got nothing else. But that'll never be good enough. There's just, see, sometimes you might say the right thing, but that's not how you really live. Y your life is a lie. You, you have, you, you'll say like Wesley, he would say orthodox theology, like he believed in the substitutionary atonement. But he didn't really act like he believed in the substitutionary atonement. You know, what I, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. We, we say we believe all kinds of things, but we don't act like we believe them. Which, what does that say? We don't really believe them. We don't really believe them. And uh, human beings are, born again human beings are still a mess. Why? We have this war in us. We live in a body that in which sin dwells. Sin dwells in our flesh. Now, Nazarenes that have been sanctified deny that. They say God eradicated your flesh. That's a lie from hell. And it will bite you. The serpent has, has the serpent has deceived you and he's there ready to strike. And then what happens? You find out you're not sinlessly perfect and then you go into depression. And you can either leave the Nazarenes or you can become a hypocrite self-deceived hypocrite. But you really know you're not sinlessly perfect. Otherwise, you're completely gone. See, and if you think you're fully sanctified, you're not going to be looking to Christ and the cross. God doesn't want you fully sanctified yet. 
He wants to keep you dependent on Christ and the cross. So he allows sin in your life. Why do you think he didn't perfect us? You know, when we got saved, we don't become instantly perfect. It's a reason. We have to learn to trust him. It's a relationship. You got to grow up. God will make us sinlessly perfect when Christ comes, because that's when we need to be that. <sighs> but the theology, you can get into these things and forget what the point is. You can get so distracted about arguing about, you know, hair-splitting things and forget that the whole thing is not biblical anyway. And your argument is just the devil, and he's beguiled you. And he's just doing what the Scripture says. He's talking about the shattering of the power of the holy people of Daniel. Shatter, how many denominations are there? You know, people do these things, and they don't consider, like Ephesians, where it talks about uh, we're to exercise care to maintain the unity of the church in the Spirit of God. The Spirit, not theology. And a lot of this stuff we should, we should recognize. This is just human opinion. And if we can't distinguish between human opinion and God's Word, we've been utterly deceived. Now, I'm not saying that other people might not have come to a conclusion that's correct that we don't hold. And, yeah, they, should, they can challenge our thinking. But we go back to the Word of God. We don't go to human opinion and say, because Thomas Aquinas said this. Well, who is Thomas Aquinas? Who is he? Or was he? Or some of the, the other church fathers that people quote as if they're authoritative. They're not. Scripture alone, scriptura nuda, naked scripture, as I've been accused of being. And I've heard, I've heard that they've accused James White of being a biblicist. I thought Baptists were all biblicists. Isn't that supposed to be your authority? No, apparently it is Thomas Aquinas. See, that shows it exploded, and they went off. It's just like the, the young, restless, and reformed. That movement has exploded, disintegrated, and many or most of those young people that were so infatuated with reformed theology by people like Piper, Piper the hedonist, went off into wokeism. In, because it was all of the flesh. It wasn't the work of God. It was the work of the flesh. Because God does not say, here, this is the London 1689 Confession. Read this. This is my word. No. He gave us his word, and uh, that was not part of it. And people don't even understand what the 1689 Confession was. That was the second confession by the the Baptists of the London area. The Westminster Confession of Faith came along, which was a prescriptive government mandated confession under Cromwell and Parliament during the English Civil War. So we have to look think of the, the history here. And it was designed to replace the 39 articles and it was a, supposed to be a unified confession for Scotland and England and Ireland, I suppose, <laughs> Wales, the unified Protestant confession. Uh, Catholics were supposed to be suppressed anyway. Uh, and authoritative. It was the king's confession. Well, not, well they, they had chopped off his head by this time, or were going to shortly. Uh, no, I guess it was Parliament's confession. Parliament was the one that, that ordered it to be written. Uh, so, 
I, so so the, the the Baptists were being persecuted anyway. So they looked at the at the Westminster Confession of Faith and said, well, you can agree with most of this stuff. Now we just have to tweak a little bit here. So the the London Baptist Confession was really issued in a lot of ways as an apologetic to say, look, Baptists are hardly different at all than the Reformed Anglican Presbyterian crowd. We believe almost we're almost identical. That was the purpose. Why did they, there was there was nothing really wrong with the first London Baptist Confession, but they wanted to to show that they weren't heretics, and they do you know so well we have little difference about church structure and and uh, a little bit different take on on. Uh, the sacraments, we don't believe that they're means of grace. We simply really, I, well, I don't even know what they say in there. Uh, I've forgotten, but they uh, don't believe in uh, infant baptism. Baptism does not regenerate. So just, just, it was all, the Baptist distinctives were actually toned down, or the biblical distinctives. Toned down. Uh, and the, the lineage is that the, the, uh, the Congregationalists came out of the Anglican, Reformed, Puritan section of the English church, saying, look it, uh, we don't believe that the Scripture teaches a hierarchy, a hierarchy of bishops with the king at the top the king of England at the top. We believe that the local church is the church and there's no hierarchical or denominational structure. Beyond that, congregationalism. And then out of the congregationalism, they, they because they looked at the Bible, they didn't see it. Then they looked in the Bible and said, we don't see infant baptism in the Bible either. That's where you got the Baptists. So it went from the... Puritans to the Congregationalists to the Baptists as they searched the Scripture and were forced more and more in that direction. It wasn't created. The, the 1689 Confession didn't give birth to Baptists. The Bible did. Uh, the, the Baptists are imperfectly followers of the Bible very imperfectly. But they're losing it. They're losing it. And James White is in the few and he's really saying, hey, wait a minute. Show me this in the Scripture. And because he says that, James White's a heretic. It's all about Aquinas, you know. No, they're heretics. They don't even know where they've, they've come from. They don't know where they're going. And it's all over. Christian. It's interesting. Who was it said? Who was it said that we're in the great we're in the great apostasy? Somebody said that the other day. I heard it. Besides, besides me, I think it was James White. I could be wrong about that. But I thought eh, he actually recognizes that. But his eschatology is really bad. That's mixed up. Well, that's because he's hanging around with the wrong crowd. Bad company corrupts good morals. Doesn't the scripture say that? That's that's. He got seduced into going over to apology, and that's bad. Uh, anyway, the whole video. Is, the point is, don't get lost in theology. Don't don't, or you'll end up really lost. Don't be removed from the simplicity that's in Christ and the simple devotion to Christ. Don't be removed from the cross because that's what the Bible's about. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to do what? To die on a cross to atone for your sins, to take the penalty for your sins, for the wages of sin is death, upon himself, because only he could bear it. The perfect, sinless Son of God became a sin offering for you. 
He took your sins upon himself and offered up his life to die in your place, that you might be reconciled to God, that God could be both just, having fulfilled the requirements of his justice and his law, that the wages of sin is death, and also pronounce you not guilty and reconcile you to himself because Jesus Christ paid your penalty in full. And then he rose from the dead demonstrating that he had accomplished that. Otherwise, he would not have been able to rise from the dead. Death could not hold him because he's God and he paid the penalty. See, he, he became a man subject to the law fulfilled the law perfectly. So if you think that Jesus sinned, if he, Jesus sinned, you don't have a Savior. You have no salvation. Just like Greider with this, uh, this stupid, this moronic uh, governmental theory of atonement where God just executed his son as a demonstration that sin is a serious thing which makes no sense at all. It's totally irrational. What that is is really a manifestation of the hatred of the cross and the desire for self-salvation, just like the Pharisees. Not knowing the righteousness of God and uh, seeking to establish their own righteousness. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Not knowing that God gives righteousness as a gift to those who believe in Jesus Christ. He purchased righteousness for you. He purchased acceptance with God for you by fulfilling the demands of God's justice that you die. He fulfilled that for you. For God so loved the world. It's, it's not this uh, Paul Washer blasphemous illustration, or almost blasphemous, I should say that God is, is, is seeking to torch you and cast you into hell, God the Father. But the Son interposes himself. No. No, that, that is a total mischaracterization of God and the cross. The Father sent his only begotten Son into the world because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, that all those who are believers in him should not perish in hell, but receive eternal life with God, reconciled to him. Don't be removed from that. Don't let anybody lead you away from that. What Christ did on the cross is the gospel. And if he did not die for your sins to pay the punishment that God's justice and God's law demanded, then you are still in your sins and you're still going to hell. And if you do not believe in him, you're still going to hell. As the scripture says in John chapter 3, those that refuse to believe, and that's probably the better way to render that, the wrath of God abides on them, continues to abide on you as long as God abides, which is forever. Hell is eternal because God is eternal and his wrath is eternal and abides on those who reject his free gift of salvation. You know, if you sent your own son into the world, he became flesh, suffered, was mocked, dishonored, spit upon, beaten, scourged, and then nailed to a bloody cross to die for your sins. And you say to God, I don't give a damn. You think he might be upset with you? 
even more so than because of your breaking his commandments, his laws? You've rejected his salvation. You've rejected his gift. You've rejected his son. You let his son die for you, and you trample his blood underfoot as if it's an unclean thing. Just, you think God might be angry? You bet. Suggest you turn to God and call upon him to save you from your sin. Christ's blood, Christ's sacrifice can cover all sins except the refusal to hear the gospel closing your ears to God's Spirit when he calls you, reveals your sin, and shows you Christ as your substitute. And you say, I don't want that. Well, that God will take you and give you your wish then. He's got a place for people that don't want God's salvation. It's called hell, God's eternal penitentiary. Not a, not a very pleasant place. Because there's nothing good there. You've rejected all that is good. So you'll get what's not. Bad plan. Very bad plan. <laughs>